Well, recently, I understand there were some rumors going around, said specifically by someone in this pulpit, that I was a bit of a challenging child. <laughs> and I'm here to just clear up any doubts you may have about me or it's all true. I had a lot of energy. My goal was to make everyone laugh, and I was stubborn. And that is the perfect recipe to become the favorite student of every teacher in every school. <laughs> Teaching me was incredibly challenging. <laughs> kind of early for amens, but... <laughs> Luckily, I had teachers who loved and cared enough about me to take the time to teach and challenged me while still allowing me to be creative. Miss Bennett was an elementary teacher who let me join the gifted and talented program because she saw the potential of my creative thought processing. Dr. Lofton, my ninth grade science teacher, showed incredible patience in the classroom, but she also taught me that learning could be fun. And now she's an amazing greeter every Sunday morning here at church. Miss Wisnat went above and beyond the role of a teacher and spent extra time teaching me calculus and pushed me to work harder and focus. Dr. Bartell was a college professor who inspired me to fall in love with scripture and taught me how to study the Bible. I had incredible teachers who helped me reach my full potential. Teachers are valuable men and women who have been called by God to invest in the next generation. And I am thankful for the incredibly skilled educators that God put in my life. Jesus was a master teacher. He spoke to rich people, poor people, politicians, fishermen, leaders of society, and outcasts. Regardless of the makeup of the crowd, Jesus had the ability to draw in his audience with questions and stories. And once he captured their attention, he drove the point home. One of the things that I love so much about Jesus' teaching style is he was comfortable not giving all the answers and solutions. Jesus wanted people to think, to figure things out for themselves and apply principles to their lives. Now in America, we are not very comfortable with that kind of teaching in church. We have become accustomed to someone telling us everything that it's supposed to mean, everything that we're supposed to do with it, and they're supposed to give us all the answers. And that's easy, and it's really convenient, but I'm not sure it's always best. One of the glaring weaknesses I see in our students is they don't know how to fend for themselves. Everything is quick and easy and spoon-fed to them. There's so many simple life and spiritual things they don't know how to do because they've never had to do it. Someone always does it for them. So parents, listen. Challenge your kids to try. Let them fail and help them to learn how to get up and try again. That way, when they get older, they will be able to stand on their own without you. I want you to think. I want you to apply truths from Scripture to your own life. I want you to wrestle with a passage and try to determine what it means. I want you to rely on the Bible more than you rely on me. If we can accomplish that, you will be a stronger follower of Jesus and we will be a stronger church. At first glance, the parables of Jesus are pretty straightforward. But in this series, we're taking them more than a first glance. We're looking deeper between the lines, trying to determine the original meaning and the meaning for us today. On the occasion we look at today, Jesus was teaching a large crowd. Luke tells us there were thousands of people in the crowd. They were trampling over one another. Jesus started teaching them about the Pharisees, warning and instructing. When right in the middle of a serious line of teaching, he was interrupted. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus, the Son of God, was teaching. 
Thousands of people were gathered. They were trying to be as quiet as possible so that everyone could hear. And in the middle of that crowd was one clueless dude who wasn't paying attention to anything that Jesus was saying. All he was thinking about was his inheritance. He was so selfish, he decided to interrupt the Messiah. Yo, Jesus... I know you've been busy healing people, raising them from the dead, but it's my money and I need it now. Jesus, make my brother give me my money. And you can imagine the reaction of the crowd. Hey, dummy, Jesus is talking. We're trying to learn here. No one cares about your brother or your money. And Jesus looked at the man and said, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? In other words, be quiet. That's not my mission. I didn't come here to settle your petty disputes. Then Jesus used the rude man's interruption to make a point to the entire crowd. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, we don't think that way, do we? You see rich and famous people with all their stuff, and you think, they've got it made. That would be the life. You see, all too often, society measures people not by who they are, but by what they have. Annie Leonard wrote a book titled The Story of Stuff, How Our Obsession with Stuff is Trashing the Planet, Our Communities, and Our Health, and A Vision for Change. It's a great title. But in it, she says, we work more hours than folks in almost any other industrialized country in the world. And two of our main activities in our scant leisure time are TV watching and shopping. We go to work, come home exhausted, and plop down in front of the TV. Commercials tell us we need new stuff, so we go shopping. And in order to pay for it all, we have to work even more. Watching the way we live, it appears that we believe my life consists of what I have, my stuff. I've got to get the latest thing. How can I live without that iPad? I need that new car. I really need that new boat. And I definitely got to have those new shoes. We live our lives to accumulate possessions. We are just like the interrupting man, too busy thinking about our stuff to follow the words of Jesus. To which Jesus responds, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And apparently, that response quieted the guy down. And then to just hammer the point to the interrupting man, the crowd, and to us, Jesus told a story, a parable that you may not have heard before. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. It was a banner year, a huge harvest, the biggest year ever. The rich farmer had a problem. His harvest was too big for his barns. So he hatched a plan. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. That was his plan. It's a good year. Even though I'm rich, you can never have too much. So, since I've got so much, I'll tear down the perfectly good barns that have worked up until now, and I'll build bigger ones so I can store all of my grain and all of my stuff. In today's world, man, What a great year financially. we got to build a bigger house. I don't have enough room for all my stuff. And I'm going to need more room to put all the more stuff I'm going to buy because it was such a good year. And you know what? I might even need to put a shed in the backyard. we got to build a bigger office. Since we've had such a great year, you know what? Let's just get more stuff. Let's build bigger places to keep it. Apparently, sharing never occurred to this guy. Remember, he was already rich. This wasn't, oh, now I can finally live without the pressures. 
This was the rich getting richer. He already had a lot, and now he had even more. He said, I will tear down my barns. Notice that? Not my barn, but barns. Dude had multiple barns. He had a lot of stuff. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I've arrived. I made it. And now I'm just going to sit back. I'm just going to enjoy my stuff. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. God said, hey, good plan. The whole bigger barns thing, it's going to be awesome. The only problem is, you're going to die tonight. And when you die, what good are all those bigger barns? This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This guy should have shared with the people around him. Instead, his selfish goal was the accumulation of stuff, stuff, and more stuff. And then he died. And the thing he wouldn't do while he was alive, give to others and share, was now out of his control. Someone else was going to get all of his stuff. And you have a choice. You can share willingly while you are alive or unwillingly when you die. But whether you want to or not, one day you will share. And that's the key question. Ultimately, who gets it? Good story. Interrupting man was really feeling stupid at this point. But then Jesus hits the crowd gathered there and us with a major reality check. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Mic drop. This story doesn't just apply to greedy, selfish, interrupting man. It applies to us as well. When you live your life to accumulate possessions, when you measure your value by what you have and what you can get and make that your life goal, when you do all that instead of generously giving to God, you are like the rich fool who built bigger barns to store his crops and his stuff. All that stuff you work so hard to accumulate and save, one day won't do you any good. When you hoard it for yourself, you are foolishly building bigger barns. On this occasion, Jesus didn't leave them wondering what the application was. Instead, he followed it with a familiar teaching. Therefore, since you don't want to be like that guy who hoards things for himself and isn't generous towards God, I tell you, do not worry about your life or your inheritance or your crops or your stuff. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. In other words, why are you so stressed out about your clothes and where you live and what if I have enough? Isn't life more than enough? Isn't life more than that? Isn't life more than all the stuff that has you stressed out and worried? Now, having established that, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? That's a whole lesson in itself. Because actually, all that worrying is probably just at taking years off of your life. Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus is talking about the way you feel every day. Decision after decision, pressure after pressure. Jesus says, O you of little faith, don't you trust me? If you trusted me, you would know I'm willing to carry that burden for you. You don't have to live that way. 
And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world, people who don't even believe in God, people who believe when you die, it's all over. That's how they live their life. Run after such thing, and your father knows that you need them. That's powerful. Your heavenly father knows what you need. God understands your needs. He understands the pressure. God is not a distant God sending out unreasonable commands without regard for your condition. Your heavenly father knows what you need. Now, the problem is we have a tendency to turn wants into needs. We say things like, I really need the new iPhone. I really need to go to Hawaii. And I definitely need cable TV. We turn wants into needs so we can justify our irrational spending and our misplaced priorities. I think there's basically four categories when it comes to your wants and your needs. There are things you really need, things you think you need, things you don't need but really think you need, things you never knew you needed or wanted until you saw someone else with them and now you know that there's no way you can live without them. <laughs> Need is a funny word. Sometimes what you want is nowhere near what you need. Every parent in the room understands that. If you give your children everything they want, you will destroy them. But you'll do whatever it takes to give them everything they need. The question is, what do you really need? Your heavenly father knows what you need. Then in the next verse, Jesus gave the principle. Let me tell you a whole different way of living life. A whole different approach to everything you own, everything you need. An approach that will help you handle all that stress and worry. And I think you'll recognize this verse. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. God says, if you'll make me the priority, if you'll make my kingdom the priority, if you will put my kingdom first, I'll take care of all those other things that you're worried about. See, God is not against you having good food, nice clothes, a place to sleep, and a car to drive. God is not against your new computer, private school for your kids, and that vacation. God is not against that stuff. Jesus is saying, you've got to determine what's going to be your priority. If your priority is accumulating stuff, you're just like the pagans who live their lives running after that. You're like the guy who tore down the perfectly good barns to build bigger barns. You're like the guy who missed my teaching because he was too concerned about his money. It's not about how much you have. It's more a question of priority. What matters most to you? Now, how do you safeguard against being like that rich, foolish farmer? How do you ensure you are being rich towards God and seeking his kingdom? Well, I've got a couple suggestions for you. The first, evaluate your stuff. You have to decide how much is enough. Am I like that rich fool building new barns so I just have more stuff? Am I measuring my life by my possessions? Evaluate. How important is stuff to me? Is my life out of balance? If it is, it's time to get rid of some stuff. It's time to reorder your financial life. People all across America think Marie Kondo is a genius, but there's no magic in holding your possessions and asking whether or not it sparks joy. It's a little weird. But her method works because it forces you to actually inventory and evaluate your possessions. Here's some questions to help you evaluate your stuff. How long has it been since I've used this or worn this? If it's been over a year, 
it's probably time to get rid of it. Why did I buy this in the first place? I'm not using the bread maker. Why did I buy a bread maker? Am I competing with others with my stuff? Did I buy this because I need it? Or because it's the latest, greatest that will make me look cool? Am I worshiping this stuff? Did I choose this over honoring God with my tithe? I can't tell you how many people say they can't afford to tithe, but somehow still afford the latest iPhone. Ask yourself, what could I have done with the money I spent on this stuff to make an eternal difference? And start with you, not someone else. I don't collect many things, but I love shoes. And after looking through my closet and evaluating my shoes, I noticed that I had a lot of shoes that I never wore. So I went through my shoes and I gave a lot of them away. And I'll be honest, that was really challenging for me to do. Now, Meredith's stuff, I have zero issues giving away her stuff. <laughs> Chuck it, trash it, donate it. I don't even think twice about it. It's easy for me to give away your stuff. It's a little more difficult when it's my stuff. Evaluate your stuff, not other people's stuff. And after evaluating your stuff, it's important to make sure you are being obedient with your finances. Tithe. Tithing is giving the first 10% of your income to God. Now, I'm presenting this as a suggestion, but it's not really a suggestion. When you turn a command into a suggestion, you justify radical disobedience, and then you still expect God's blessing. It's clear in Scripture, God expects us to commit the first 10% to him. Listen to this. Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how, how do we rob you? In tithes and offering. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. This is simple. If you're not giving God his share of what God gave you, you're like the rich fool, building barns to store your stuff while being stingy towards God. If you aren't tithing, it's time to start. Blessing follows obedience. Well, I just want to give my tithe to others. Well, that's not God's system. When you do that, you're giving away what already doesn't belong to you. That doesn't make sense. The first 10% is God's. I give that back to him. Any sharing I do is beyond that. A great way to fight the natural tendency to be selfish is share. For Meredith and me, tithing isn't enough. That's just meeting the minimum. We want to go beyond the minimum. We give every week to missions, sharing what we have with others. Now, we choose to do it that way because we're able to combine what we share with what a lot of you share to make an even bigger impact. And I like knowing that there's accountability with my money and where it's going. Giving to missions through the church helps to make sure I'm not getting ripped off by somebody. You might do it another way, and that's okay. You don't have to share the same way that I share. But it's important that you don't hoard it all for yourself. Maybe you provide a meal for a couple who just had a baby. Maybe you keep a $20 bill tucked in your wallet specifically to give someone when the Lord prompts you. Put an Every Soul Matters to God card with it. Maybe you pick up a coffee for a coworker that you know has had a really tough week. Maybe you bring groceries for share your lunch. Or you send a gift card to your kid's teacher. Or you reserve a weekly or monthly amount you will give in special offerings. The reality class of 2023 has really bought into this principle. This year, their class pastors, Vanuel and Lindsay Hart, wanted them to do something outward focused. So they decided to set a goal for their class to bring 4,000 pounds of food in nine weeks for share your lunch. 
Now, that's a really big goal for a group of eighth graders. It's a big goal for a group of adults. Immediately, their students got excited about giving to share your lunch. Students like Alex Stafford and Axton Tackett raised money by doing chores around their house and for other people. Every week, bringing in more and more food. It was amazing to see their class do whatever they could to bring in food. In over nine weeks, the class of 2023 gave 4,062 pounds of food to share your lunch. The food made a huge difference and impact for hungry people in our church and around our city. The intentional decision to be outward focused and share changed the lives of those students and fed the hungry. God will bless that. And finally, make God's kingdom your first priority. Now, how do you do that? Jesus didn't tell them exactly, and I'm not going to tell you. But it has to do with your mindset, the position of your heart, your motives, and where you place your security and your trust. When I was a teenager, I dreamed of buying a boat for fishing and duck hunting. I researched every boat brand, every model. I knew the differences in the whole shape. I knew the materials that you needed to make the boat. I knew it, the boat I wanted, the engine I wanted on that boat. I, want, I knew the depth finder I wanted on that boat. I knew the trolling motor I wanted. I knew everything about the boat. I worked multiple summers at Wild River Country, saving my money for one purpose. I was going to buy my boat. Finally, I had the money for my boat, and I was already in process of finding it. Then one Sunday night, our campus pastors from our Nashville campus were speaking in our Sunday night service. At the time, they were planning a church in Santa Monica, California. And as they spoke and shared their dream of starting a healthy church, I felt the Holy Spirit speaking to me in a still, quiet voice. This is my dream. And after church, we went to dinner with Nathan and Jessica, and I handed them a check for $6,900. Every dollar I had saved for my dream boat. My dream, my priority was for a boat. And it was going to be a sweet boat, let me tell you. <laughs> but God's dream was to start a church where lost people could find hope and new life in Jesus. I chose God's dream over my dream. Now, do I get this right every time? Of course not. But I am increasingly determined to make sure I live by the principle, his kingdom first. Now, how does that principle look for you? I can't answer that. You're going to have to wrestle with your priorities and your decisions and your purchases. But I can tell you, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Listen to the Lord. Be sensitive to his voice. He has and he will reveal the way you can put his kingdom first with your stuff. Would you bow your heads with me? And understand I'm coming from the, the position of somebody who struggled with this. But if you're here watching online and you just say, you know what? My priorities have been out of whack. I've been dreaming about a boat and God's been dreaming about lost people. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Nobody's looking around, just me. If you're watching online, there's a button you can click. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I know it takes a lot of honesty and vulnerability for that. Thank you. Lord, I pray for the people here and watching online. Lord, who recognize that their priorities have been out of line. That just like the rich fool, 
just like the interrupting man, they've been putting their, their wants in front of your needs. They've been putting their dreams in front of your dreams. Lord, I pray that as they recognize that, you would begin to, to speak to them. Lord, that you would begin to show them the areas and the ways that they can start putting your kingdom first. And Lord, as they do that, I pray that you would bless them abundantly, overwhelmingly. Lord, that they would be blessed with more than they ever had before that they were being selfish with. Lord, I pray that you would help all of us. Lord, that we would never take for granted what you've given to us. That we would never see what we have in this life as ours but yours. And we would begin to steward it that way. We would begin to live our lives doing everything and anything we can to move your kingdom, to put your kingdom first. Jesus, help me to never lose the mentality of your kingdom first. Lord, we never want to be in a place where we forget that and we become selfish and we place our, our dreams above your dreams. Lord, I pray um, if there's someone here tonight that's been dreaming of buying something they've always dreamed of. And tonight, they began to hear your voice telling them what your dream is. Lord, I pray that they would be confident that that is your voice. And also they would be confident that being obedient and making the decision to be obedient will do way more than what they would have purchased, than what they would have gotten from what they dreamed. Lord, we, um, we want our lives to put your kingdom first. Our stuff, our words, our actions, our social media. Lord, I pray that no one would ever look at us and not see you and not see your kingdom. Let our lives be reflections of who you are. Let every interaction we have with people, whether in person or online, reflect your love and your mercy and your grace and your patience. Give us a supernatural understanding to be able to have grace and patience and mercy with people we don't agree with. Lord, we, um, we love you. We worship you. We thank you that you are not a silent God and that you are a God who knows exactly what we need. Thank you that in everything, we can rest assured in the promise that you're taking care of us and you're watching over us. Lord, we thank you for that promise. We thank you for your love. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.